Thank you for joining in for the session on diabetes. As we were just talking, the biggest worry is the fact that our country is the diabetic capital of the world. In amongst six diabetic people globally, one at least is from India. And it plagues not just elderly, but also adults, middle-aged and young teenagers. The question is that why is it on the rise? Why are we a diabetic nation? Even though, just as I said, that we have so much of research and technologies. And I attribute quite a lot of this to simple misinformation. Yes, there is a lot of misinformation, which is uh, kind of you know, just circulating around and repeated so many times and so loud and clear that it has almost become like truth. Today, as we uh, proceed with this uh, information on nutrition and lifestyle regarding diabetes, uh, as we all, I think all here must be knowing that diabetes can be classified into three kinds, diabetes one, type one, type two, and the gestational diabetes. Today, we're going to talk majorly on type two diabetes. First thing I would like to say that it is an, a lifestyle disorder and it is completely preventable and is reversible also. When I say it is a lifestyle disorder, that means it has been caused by the wrong kind of a lifestyle and dietary habits. When we make changes in our lifestyle and dietary habits, food habits, we definitely are able to reverse it and manage it. But before making any kind of changes, we need to understand the root cause, why do we have diabetes? Or on the other hand, as we say, it, why the sugar levels spike? So let us first understand that how sugar is managed in the body. In simple words, if I put it, when we eat food, it is digested and is converted to glucose, which is there in the blood and causes a rise in the blood glucose level. This immediately stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin, which comes and takes the glucose and takes it to all the cells of the body, knocks at the doors, the cell doors open, and the insulin deposits the glucose into each cell, where it is stored as glycogen and is used as and when needed. We can easily compare it with like a simple life example. When we bring ration in our houses, there is one person in the house to take care of, you know, picking up it all, sorting it out and putting it at the right place so that it can be used as and when wanted. The insulin is kind of that person who's taking all the glucose and putting it at the right places. The problem arises when there is insulin resistance. So when we eat, the glucose comes into the blood, the pancreas secrete the insulin, and the insulin goes and knocks at the cell doors. But the knock is so feeble that the cell doors do not hear that knock, and they do not open. The glucose remains in the blood, the pancreas sends the high level of glucose, and again secrete more insulin. When this volume of insulin increases, then the knock is also louder and the cell doors open and the glucose is pushed into inside the cells. This, when carried on over a long period of time, creates a pressure over exertion on the pancreas. They are overworked, exerted and get exhausted and slowly the levels of insulin decrease. This is when a person is diagnosed with diabetes and is put on medications. This, uh, all of this clearly indicates that it is not just food, which the food that is being eaten, uh, the food uh, is just not, it's a small picture there. There is much more to it. Why is the insulin not being secreted properly? Why is the pancreas not strong enough to secrete the insulin? Why are the cells not responding to the insulin? And so much more. That is why I say this is the most misunderstood disorder. Whenever we talk about diabetes, all that we talk about is the blood sugar levels. That is one side of the picture. That is the superficial thing that we are seeing. 
deep inside, what we need to notice is that the cells are starved. The cells are lacking in the nutrient which the insulin was supposed to carry to them. So the whole disorder has been reduced to blood sugar levels, wherein the whole problem should be looked upon as cell starvation, which in turn creates nerve issues, which would then lead to leg pains, kidney problems, eye problems, retinal problems, which, is, which are the classic symptoms of diabetes. In fact, I call this as a nutrient wastage disease because a substantial amount of nutrients are lost via the urine when they are not being sent to the cells. And there is nothing done, no efforts uh, to replenish the nutrients. That is where we fail. And this loose advice of that we need to lose weight to uh, you know, manage diabetes does not really work because it is a multifactorial thing that we're looking at. There are many causes. It is not just weight or obesity. There are many other metabolic syndromes like cholesterol, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, high BP. If a person has been on steroids, if uh, there is pregnancy, if there is any other critical illness or even simple reasons like a sedentary lifestyle or even loads of stress. So there, when the problems are so many, then just this uh, simple thing to think upon that we just need to lose weight and we need to go on some restrictive diets or we need to overexercise is not going to help us because that would be like a punishment on the already starving cells. There we need a very, very holistic approach. An approach where we can have, we have to look at all parameters. So it is not just a question of whether sugar uh, is to be eaten or not to be eaten, whether carbs have to be deleted or not to be deleted, but it is an entire holistic approach, as you can see, which needs to uh, focus on the nutrition strategies, on exercise, on good lifestyle habits, and on our emotions also. Before I move on to the nutrition strategies, which we basically want to talk about, I would just slightly like to touch on the topics, the other uh, strategies which I'm talking about. The first thing that we need to consider is exercise. We need to understand that exercise is a non-negotiable part of life. Somewhere we fail to schedule it in our everyday life. And this is something we need to educate people about, that it is exercise which helps our body, just like food helps our body. But what I hear mostly is that, yes, I go for my walks. I go for my walk regularly. But it is not just the cardio, not just the walks that we have to look into. First thing, uh, when we say that, yeah, I will walk more, the walks itself are not getting planned. You know, we just keep planning that, okay, tomorrow morning, I'm definitely going to wake up early and I'm going for a walk. So most of the days are spent in just planning the walks. And if there are people who are going for an hour walk in the morning since years, yet there has never been seen a, a big change in their clinical conditions. The reason being, that again, as I said, that the cells are starved and we are kind of punishing them by that one hour walk in the morning, which generally people start on an empty stomach. Instead, what should we be looking for is to be active throughout the day. Doing an hour's walk in the morning and being a couch potato throughout the day or just sitting on your desk as your profession would demand is not going to keep you active. So we need to be active through the day and what is more important in diabetes is that we need to walk after meals. As the saying goes, that after a meal, rest for a while and then walk a mile stands very, very true for diabetes management. So we need to make sure that a 15-minute walk after each meal should be encouraged for our diabetic person. Apart from the walking, what we need to look into is weight training simply, which is known as strength exercises, which can be done. You don't have to rush to the gym for that. You can uh, promote uh, weight exercises at home with your body weight, with resistance band, with simple weights, small uh, dumbbells and all. 
But what is the advantage of this weight training is that it helps us build muscular strength. It helps us get bone density. It promotes uh, uh, the growth of neurotransmitters. All in all, it is helping to increase the insulin sensitivity. And what is the biggest role of this when we do a 40 minute session of weight training? Then there is an afterburn for 36 to 48 hours. And this afterburn increases the abilities of the body to burn fat. It is higher capabilities for all these hours. So that is the right way to lose fat. But again, when we say that we should do exercises, does not mean that we should be over exercising. If a person thinks that, okay, then if I'm going to get an afterburn, so why not exercise for two hours? And then I'll get loads of afterburn and I'm going to lose my fat very quick. But that's not how the body works. It is not doing maths over there. When we work more than 40 minutes, work out more than 40 minutes, then there is muscle breakdown. And then they're broken down beyond repair. So it gets more troublesome. So we need to exercise, we need to do the right kind of exercises and we need to do adequate exercise. Apart from that, we need to look into yoga, which can be of course done every day. Weight loss is all about hormonal balances and yoga balances the entire body. So when we do yoga, when we do asanas like forward bending and twisting, turning, we kind of strengthen the organs. We strengthen the pancreas, the liver, the kidneys. And that is how it helps to manage diabetes. The pancreas is secreting better insulin. And of course, when we do yoga, we need to make sure that there is consistency and we are doing the basics so that we retain the flexibility to do these kind of bendings and twisting. Otherwise, it is not possible for us to manage those simple asanas also.